Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. What is the devotion to the Sacred Heart? Well, one of the manifestations of the devotion is to have <clears throat> a, uh, a shrine in your home. A, an image of the Sacred Heart where it's set up and honored in order to make reparation to the Sacred Heart. I have a book here that I would like to read. And um, I've already read it. And it's an important book because Jesus Christ directed St. Margaret Mary to have Father John Croset write the book. Unless you know the devotion to the Sacred Heart, um, you're missing out. Big time. So, I'm going to read it. It's going to take me probably two weeks. Alright? And I made many notes on this. Many notes. And so... It's an awesome book. So it's called The Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, How to Practice the Sacred Heart Devotion by Father John Croset. Now who is Father John Croset? He was the priest who heard the confessions of St. Margaret Mary. He was her confessor. And she told him, Jesus wants you to write the book on the Sacred Heart. You can take this to the bank. Okay, now, um, getting a lot of feedback on Francis and uh, the new church, you know, I'm not going to argue with anybody. If you want to stay in that church, you don't have real sacraments. You don't have real sacraments. You are laboring under doubt because the sacraments were changed. You know, uh, lay people, poor lay people, we don't know, you know. The, the form and the matter of the sacraments have to be correct in order for us to have a true sacrament. But, um, I'm not going to fight with people. If, the, if that's where people want to stay, uh, Francis does not profess the Catholic faith. So, if, if you are under Francis, you must obey him. You can't question him. You can't question his mass. You can't question anything that he says. He's a holy father. If you don't believe that, you are under Francis in a church that has priests that aren't real priests. And so I, I figured this out 11 years ago. I've been, you know, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not changing anything. This is where we are. And I would rather suffer as a traditional Catholic then run back there and have a life of ease. That is not what Catholics do. It's easy to be under Francis. I'd be living it up. But, um, it's not real. I can't do that. And so let me begin this awesome book. <clears throat> so you understand who's writing this book. It's the priest who had an intimate knowledge of what the Sacred Heart said. He heard the confessions of the visionary of the Sacred Heart, St. Margaret Mary. <clears throat> and um, this, is, this is what Jesus wants you to know. 
Okay. So let's get right into it. With chapter one. I'm a little tired. The book starts out with the life of St. Margaret Mary, a la Coke. And it's lengthy, but... I think what I'll do is I'll read her life on the second frame. I'm not going to skip it permanently. But I'm just going to read it on the second go-round. Okay. So, what do we mean by devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and in what does it consist? The particular object of this devotion is the immense love of the Son of God. The immense love of the Son of God. Which induced Him to deliver Himself up to death for us, and to give himself entirely to us in the blessed sacrament of the altar. Stop right there. What is the Sacred Heart Devotion? The Sacred Heart Devotion has an object to it. So what, what do we mean by that? The object, the focal point. Number one is the immense love of the Son of God, which induced him to die on the cross, <clears throat> and to give himself entirely to us in the blessed sacrament of the altar. So there are two objects of this devotion. Number one, it's the love of Jesus Christ for sinners. Two, it's the blessed sacrament. And so the object of the devotion is the love of Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. <clears throat> the thought of all the ingratitude and all of the outrages which he was to receive in this state of immolated victim until the end of time did not prevent him from operating this prodigy. He preferred to expose himself each day to the insults and hatred of men rather than be prevented from testifying by working the greatest of all miracles <clears throat> to what excess he loved us. <clears throat> he preferred to expose himself each day to the insults and outrages of men rather than be prevented from testifying by working the greatest of all miracles, to what excess he loved us. <clears throat> this has excited the piety and the zeal of many people, for when they consider how little the world is moved by this excess of love of the Son of God, how little men love Jesus Christ in return, and how little pains they take to be loved by him, his faithful friends have not been able to endure seeing him treated with such contempt day after day. They have endeavored to show their just sorrow at such treatment and by their ardent love, their profound respect, and by special acts of homage to testify their great desire to make reparation to the utmost of their capacity for this ingratitude and contempt. With this end in view, they have chosen certain days of the year to recognize in a more particular manner the extreme love which Jesus Christ has shown us in the Blessed Sacrament, and at the same time to make some reparation of honor to him for all the indignities and all the contempt which our amiable Savior has received and which he still receives every day in this mystery of love. I think it's a great insult if you have the true Blessed Sacrament in your, in your church and... He's not visited by anybody in the parish. 
I think that's an insult right there by the people who go there. I really do. And I only think it's that way because I, re I read this book. And you're going to see what visits to the Blessed Sacrament does for your soul and does for your, your life. So, if we were to make notes with this... Uh, with this, with what we've just read. He hasn't gotten into the meat of anything yet. He's just, he's going to get, it's a manual. This is like a manual. And so, we're getting into it. Certainly the regret which they show at the sight of the little love which men have for Jesus Christ in this adorable mystery, the sensible sorrow which they feel at seeing him so badly treated, these practices of devotion which love alone suggests and which have as their sole object to make reparation as far as possible for the outrages which he suffers there are certain proofs of the ardent love which they have for Jesus Christ and visible marks of their just gratitude. <clears throat> the object and the principal motive of this devotion is, as has been already said, the immense love which Jesus Christ has for men who, for the most part, have nothing but contempt or at least indifference for him. The end which is proposed is, firstly, to recognize and honor as much as lies in our power by our frequent adoration, by a return of love, by our acts of thanksgiving, and by every kind of homage, all the sentiments of tender love which Jesus Christ has for us in the adorable sacrament of the Blessed Eucharist, where, however, he is so little known by men, or at least so little loved even by the people, who know him. This was written in 1670-something. <clears throat> Secondly, to make reparation by all possible means for the indignities and outrages to which his love has exposed him during the course of his mortal life, and to which this same love exposes him every day in the Blessed Sacrament of the altar. <clears throat> So what is the motive? Why practice the devotion to the Sacred Heart? Well, this love that Christ has for us, that's number one. And then the idea being that very few people love Him in return. So that's the object of the devotion. The end which is proposed is firstly to recognize and honor as much as lies in our power by our adoration, by a return of love. He is so little known by men, or at least so little loved. This devotion consists, therefore, in ardently loving Jesus Christ, whom we have always with us in the adorable sacrament of the Eucharist. You see the theme over and over again is repeated that he's present in the blessed sacrament. The object of the devotion is the love of Jesus for us and the fact that he there, he's there in the Blessed Sacrament waiting for us to receive him and to adore, to visit him. So this devotion consists ardently in loving Jesus Christ, whom we have always with us in the adorable sacrament of the Eucharist, and in showing this ardent love by our grief, by showing our love, by, by feeling grief at seeing him so little honored by men. Go in the church. It's a ghost town. Think, he's really there in the tabernacle. Imagine your mother being there, just all alone, just waiting. In order to get the full impact of this, one has to meditate on it and think about all of the 
all of the contempt that's felt toward Christ. Or the indifference. So, he's so little honored by men and by our acts of reparation, we make up for this lack of love. But just as in the case of even the most spiritual devotions, we have always need of material, material, material and sensible objects which appeal to our human nature, act on the imagination and memory and facilitate the practice. So in the case of this devotion, the sacred heart of Jesus has been chosen as the sensible object most worthy of our veneration and at the same time most proper for the end proposed by this devotion. In truth, even if we had no particular reasons to give to these exercises of piety, the title of devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, it seems that we could not better express the particular character of this devotion than by this title. For indeed, this devotion properly understood is nothing else than an exercise of love. Love is its object, love is its motive and principle, and it is love that ought to be its end. The heart of man is, says St. Thomas, in a certain manner both the source of love and the seat of love. The heart of man is the source and the seat of love, says St. Thomas Aquinas. Its natural movements follow and continually imitate the affections of the soul and serve to no small extent either by their vehemence or their weakness to increase or diminish the passions. It is for this reason that we commonly attribute to the heart the most tender sentiments of the soul. And it is also that consideration which renders so precious the hearts of the saints. From what has been said so far, it is easy to see what is meant by the devotion to the Sacred Heart. By this devotion, we mean the ardent love which we conceive for Jesus Christ at the remembrance of all the marvels which he has wrought <clears throat> to show his tender love for us, especially in the Eucharist, which is the miracle of his love. We mean the keen regret we feel at the sight of the outrages which men commit against Jesus Christ in this adorable mystery. We mean the ardent desire which presses us to leave nothing undone, to make reparation for these outrages by every possible means. This is what we mean by the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and that is what it consists in. It cannot be reduced that some people, as some people might think at seeing this title, to merely loving and honoring by special worship this heart of flesh like ours which forms part of the adorable body of Jesus Christ. It is not that the Sacred Heart is not worthy of our adoration. It is enough to say that it is the heart of Jesus Christ. And if His Sacred Body and His Precious Blood deserve our respect and homage, who doesn't see that His Sacred Heart has still more special claim to respect and homage? And if we feel in ourselves such a strong attraction to the devotion to the sacred wounds, should we not feel ourselves still more penetrated with the devotion to a sacred heart? What we wish to make clear here is that the word heart is taken here only in the figurative sense, and that this divine heart, considered as a part of the adorable body of Jesus Christ, is, properly speaking, only the sensible object of this devotion. His heart. It's the sensible object of the devotion, and that it is nothing less than the immense love which Jesus Christ bears to us, which is its principal motive. It's the motive of the devotion to the Sacred Heart. So the heart is the sensible object, 
And the love of Christ for us and the Blessed Sacrament are the objects of the devotion. Now, as this love is altogether spiritual, <clears throat> it cannot be perceived by the senses. It was necessary, therefore, to find a symbol. And what symbol could be more proper and more natural for love than the heart? For the same reason the Church wishing to give us a sensible object for the sufferings of the Son of God, which are not less spiritual than His love, represents to us the image of His sacred wounds so that the devotion to the sacred wounds is, properly speaking, only a particular devotion to Jesus Christ's suffering. In like manner, the devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus is a more warm-hearted and ardent devotion towards Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament, its principal motive being the extreme love which He shows us in this sacrament, and the principal object to make reparation for the contempt and the outrages which He suffers in this same sacrament. The Sacred Heart of Jesus has, certainly, as much relation to His love, for which we endeavor by this devotion to inspire sentiments of gratitude and love, as the Sacred Wounds have to His sufferings, for which the Church endeavors to inspire her children with sentiments of gratitude and love by devotion to these Sacred Wounds. Now, if people had at all times such devotion to the Sacred Wounds of Jesus Christ, and if the Church, wishing to inspire all her children with love for Jesus Christ, unceasingly puts before their eyes these sacred wounds, what ought to be the effect of the remembrance of the image of the Sacred Heart? We shall see later on this devotion, we shall see later on that this devotion is not new, that several great saints confirmed the use of it by their example we can claim that the Holy See authorized the use of it under the same title since Clement X by the bull of October 4th, 1674 accorded great indulgences to an association of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in the church of the seminary of Kutan, consecrated in its honor and our Holy Father Pope Innocent the XII by a special brief has accorded a plenary indulgence in favor of the devotion of the Sacred Heart. It isn't necessary to give here the numerous reasons which show the solidity of this devotion. It is enough to say that the immense love which Jesus has for us and of which he has given such a signal proof in the adorable sacrament of the Eucharist is the principal motive. There they said it again three times. It is enough to say that the immense love which Jesus has for us and of which he has given such a signal proof in the adorable sacrament of the Eucharist is the principal motive that reparation for the contempt with which men have treated this love is the principal end proposed. That the Sacred Heart of Jesus, all inflamed with love for men, is the sensible object. <clears throat> and that a most ardent and tender love for the adorable person of Jesus Christ ought to be the fruit. Footnote. The devotion to the Blessed Eucharist and the devotion to the Sacred Heart are not only two sister devotions. In reality, they are only one and the same devotion. They complete each other and develop each other. They blend so perfectly together that one cannot go on without the other, and their union is absolute. Not only can one of these devotions not be prejudicial to the other, but because they complete each other and perfect each other, they also reciprocally increase each other. The second footnote says, if we have devotion to the Sacred Heart, we will wish to find it, to adore it, to love it. And where shall we look for it but in the Blessed Eucharist where it is found eternally living? The devotion to the Divine Heart infallibly brings souls to the Blessed Eucharist. And faith in and devotion to the Blessed Eucharist necessarily leads souls to discover the mysteries of infinite love of which the Divine Heart is the organ and the symbol. And so there you have the first chapter. The devotion to the Sacred Heart.
the love of Christ for sinners and the Blessed Sacrament. So how do you practice it? What do you do? Chapter 2 is short. I'll read it. The means which God made use of to propagate this devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Now, remember this book? This book, half of it was written by the man I'm about to speak to. Blessed Claude de la Colombière, S.J., was among the persons selected by God himself to publish this devotion to the faithful. And that's why I say we can take these words of his to the bank. <clears throat> this great servant of God was illustrious both as confessor of the faith in England and as a chaplain to the Duchess of York, afterwards Queen of England. He was celebrated for his works on religious subjects, but more celebrated for his sublime virtue. He was sent by Providence to St. Morgan Mary to assist her in her mission of establishing the public worship of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Having examined the private revelations received by St. Margaret Mary, he came to the conclusion after careful inquiry <clears throat> that those revelations were genuine and guided by divine help, he consecrated himself to the Sacred Heart. And his prayer of consecration to the Sacred Heart is written in this book, Spiritual Direction of Blessed Claude de la Colombia. The new church made him a saint. Makes them look good, right? But actually, they don't have the authority to make saints because they don't have the faith. And so we don't call him Saint Claude de la Colombia. He's blessed. Um, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Okay, so, the devotion for Father Claude de la Colombia was for him the means of arriving at great perfection. Convinced by his inquiry and by the great favors which he himself received that, that the devotion was the work of God, he regarded himself under an obligation to do all in his power to make public the treasures of grace and mercy hidden in the Sacred Heart, which hitherto had been revealed only to chosen souls. The following is what he wrote in his journal of spiritual retreats, which he composed in London and which was published after his death. It is of great historic interest because it was the first explanation of the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus addressed to the ordinary faithful. He wrote, <clears throat> At the close of this retreat, full of confidence in the mercy of my God, I have made it a law for myself to procure by all means possible the execution of what I was ordered by my adorable master concerning his most precious body in the Blessed Sacrament, in which I believe him to be truly and really present, filled with sweetness which I have been able to taste and receive from the mercy of my God, without being able to explain it, I have come to recognize that God wishes that I serve him by procuring the accomplishment of his desires concerning this devotion, which he has suggested to a person, St. Margaret Mary to whom he has communicated himself very intimately, and for whose benefit he has deigned to make use of my weakness. I have already preached this devotion to many people in England, and have written about it in France, and have asked one of my friends to make it known in the place where he is. It will be very useful there. The great number of chosen souls which there are in this community makes me believe that the practice of it in this house will be very pleasing to God. Would that I could be everywhere, O oh my God, and could publish what thou dost expect from thy servants and friends. God, having revealed himself to St. Margaret Mary, who from the graces which she has received has, I believe according to his heart, informed me about the revelations which she received. I obliged her to write down for me what she had told me. I have gladly transcribed the account into my journal of retreats, <clears throat> because the good God wishes to make use of my weakness for the execution of his designs. This saintly soul, referring to St. Margaret Mary, says, being one day before the Blessed Sacrament, during the octave of the feast, I received from my God excessive graces of his love. 
When I was moved by the desire to make some return to him and to render love for love, he said to me, You can give me no greater return than by doing what I have so many times commanded you to do. And revealing his heart to me, he said, Behold this heart, which has so loved men, as to spare itself nothing, even to exhausting and consuming itself, <clears throat> to testify to them its love, and in return I received nothing but ingratitude from the greater part of men by the contempt, irreverence, sacrileges, and coldness which they have for me in this sacrament of my love. But what is still more painful is that it is hearts consecrated to me that treat me thus, priests and nuns. For this reason I ask that the first Friday after the octave of Corpus Christi be set apart for a particular feast to honor my heart. I ask that reparation of honor be made to my heart, that communion be received on that day to repair the indignities which it has received during the time it has been exposed on the altars. And I promise you that my heart will expand itself and pour out its, in abundance the influences of its love on those who will render it this honor. Look at that promise that he makes. And so when you receive communion on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, this should be the intention. Receive on that day to repair the indignities which it has received during the time it has been exposed on the altars. When you receive communion and you want to make reparation to the Sacred Heart, you're actually receiving the Body and Blood of Christ and offering it in reparation to the lack of love, reverence, and adoration that is due the Blessed Sacrament and is not granted. <clears throat> but my Lord, to whom dost thou address thyself, said St. Margaret Mary, when Jesus said this to her. To a wretched slave, Jesus said, to a poor sinner, who by her unworthiness would be capable of hindering thy designs. That was a mistake. She's speaking about herself. But my Lord... To whom dost thou address thyself? To a wretched slave, to a poor sinner, who by her unworthiness would be capable of hindering thy designs. Thou hast so many generous souls to execute thy commands. Our, resp our Savior responded, Poor innocent that you are. Do you not know that I make use of the weak to confound the strong? that it is usually on the, lowly, on the lowly, lowliest and the poorest in spirit that I show my power with greatest effect in order that they may attribute nothing to themselves? Give me then, said I, St. Margaret Mary, the means to do what thou dost command me to do, she said to Jesus. And then Jesus said, address yourself to my servant, Blessed Claude de la Colombière, and tell him, on my part, Jesus said, to do everything possible to establish this devotion and to give this pleasure to my divine heart. Tell him not to be discouraged by the difficulties which he will meet, because they will not be wanting, they will not be lacking, but he should be aware that he is all-powerful, who distrusts himself completely in order to put all his confidence in me. <clears throat> Blessed Claude, who had the gift of discernment, was not a man to believe anything lightly, but he had two striking proofs of the high and solid virtue of this person, St. Margaret Mary, who spoke to him to dread any illusion. Therefore, he applied himself immediately to the ministry that God had confided to him, but to acquit himself of it solid solidly and perfectly, he wished to begin by himself. He consecrated himself entirely to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. He offered to it all that he thought capable of honoring and pleasing it. The extraordinary graces which he received from this practice soon confirmed him in the idea that he already had the importance 
and solidity of this devotion. He had no sooner considered the sentiments full of tenderness that Jesus Christ has for us in the Blessed Sacrament, in which His Sacred Heart is always burning with love for men, always open to pour out on them all kinds of graces and blessings, that he could no longer think without grieving of the horrible outrages which Jesus Christ suffers at the hands of the heretics and of the strange contempt with which even the generality of Catholics treat Jesus Christ in this august sacrament. This neglect and contempt, you see that? Even the generality of Catholics, the generality, generally, most people, this neglect and contempt and these outrages touched him sensibly and obliged him to consecrate himself anew by this beautiful prayer which he calls the offering to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and which will be found at the end of this chapter. The voyage of this servant of God to England, his imprisonment at his early, and his early death after his return to France did not permit him to give further instruction on this devotion to the public. But God did not leave his work undone. He himself made use of the mysterious influence of his grace to accomplish his designs. In former times he had made known to St. Gertrude that this devotion was reserved for the last ages as a means to arouse the faithful from their tepidity and cowardice. Now he makes use of a humble sister to compose a little book which, though it had neither art nor design, was the means of winning over to the devotion those very persons who formerly had no relish for it and who, without hardly knowing what it was about, had opposed it. And God made use of these very people to spread the devotion everywhere. <clears throat> Thus, in less than a year, we saw this devotion happily established. The most prudent directors, doctors, and prelates have praised it. Preachers have preached it with success. Chapels have been built in honor of the Sacred Heart. Images have been engraved and painted, altars have been erected in its honor, the religious of the visitation, who in this manner have been the zealous pioneers, have had the pleasure of hearing solemnly sung in their chapel at Dijon, which they had built for the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The Mass composed in its honor, their example has been followed with great fruit by many other religious. This solid devotion to the Sacred Heart has been spread and established with marvelous success through almost the whole of France. It has passed into foreign countries. It has gone even across the seas to Quebec and Malta. And we have reason to believe that by means of missionaries, it has already spread in Syria, India, and even to China. Finally, the universal approval which this devotion has received and the esteem which people of recognized merit and virtue have for it gives us ground for hope that Jesus Christ will henceforth be less forgotten, better served, and much better loved. Offering to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, composed by Blessed Claude de la Colombière. Blessed Claude de la Colombière, having learned by his own experience how powerfully devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus helps to inflame the heart with great love for Jesus Christ and to arrive in a short time at great perfection, composed the following offering, which he was accustomed to renew several times each month with great devotion. This offering is made to honor the divine heart of Jesus, the seat of all the virtues, the source of all the blessings, and the retreat of all holy souls. The principal virtues which we propose to honor in the Sacred Heart are, first, the most ardent love for God. <clears throat> the principal virtues which we propose to honor <clears throat> in the Sacred Heart is a most ardent love for God, joined with the most profound respect and the greatest humility that ever existed in any heart, infinite patience in suffering, and most perfect contrition and sorrow for the sins of the world, which he was charged to expiate, the confidence of a tenderly loved son, joined with the confusion of a great sinner. Thirdly, a most keenly felt compassion for our miseries and immense love for us, in spite of these miseries, and notwithstanding these movements of the Sacred Heart, each of which was in the highest degree possible, unalterable calmness caused by perfect conformity with the will of God, which could not be troubled by any event, however contrary, it might appear to its zeal, its humility, its love, and all its other dispositions. This heart of Jesus has still, as far as it is possible, 
these same sentiments, and especially, it is always burning with love for us, although in return it finds nothing in the hearts of men but unkindness, neglect, contempt, and ingratitude. Jesus loves and he is not loved. His love is even unknown, because men refuse to receive these gifts by which he wishes to show his love and to listen to the secret declarations of that love which he wishes to make to their hearts. And this chapter ends with a prayer written by Father Claude de la Colombière. <clears throat> In reparation for so many outrages and such cruel ingratitude, O most adorable and amiable heart of my amiable Jesus, and as far as is in my power, to avoid falling into such an evil, I offer thee my heart, with all the sentiments of which it is capable. I give myself entirely to thee, and from this hour I protest most sincerely that I desire to forget myself and all that can have reference to myself in order to remove the obstacles which might prevent me from entering into this divine heart, which in thy divine goodness thou openest to me, and where I desire to enter in order to live and die <clears throat> with thy most faithful servants. <clears throat> Penetrated and inflamed with thy love, I now offer to thy sacred heart all the merit and satisfaction of all the masses, of all the prayers, of all the acts of mortification, of all the religious practices, of all the acts of zeal, humility, obedience, and all the other virtues which I shall practice until the last moment of my life, not only with all this, be to honor the Sacred Heart of Jesus and its admirable dispositions. But in addition, I most humbly beseech him to accept the entire donation which I make to him of them, and to dispose of them in the manner which pleases him, and in favor of whomsoever it pleases him. And as I have already given to the holy souls in purgatory all that is in my actions capable of satisfying divine justice, I desire that it be distributed to them according to the good pleasure of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. This will not prevent me from acquitting myself of the obligation which I have of saying Mass and praying for certain intentions as prescribed by obedience from offering Mass out of charity for poor people or from my brothers and friends who may ask for, who may ask for them. What he's saying is he just gave all of his merits to the Sacred Heart. But he's saying, what about the Masses that he offers for those other intentions? He's saying those still stand because he's a priest. He had to offer Mass. So what he's saying is I offer all this up, but for those other things, this will not prevent me from acquitting myself of the obligation which I have of offering Mass, etc. But as on such occasions I make use of a good that does not belong to me, I intend as is just that the obedience and charity and other virtues which I shall practice on such occasions be all for the Sacred Heart of Jesus. From it, I hope to receive the grace to practice these virtues, which consequently will belong to it without reserve. Sacred Heart of Jesus, teach me to sacrifice myself completely. Teach me what I must do to arrive at the purity of thy love with the desire of which thou hast inspired me. You see, God inspires this prayer. God inspires our prayers. And he just said it, Sacred Heart of Jesus, teach me to sacrifice myself completely. Teach me what I must do to arrive at the purity of thy love, with the desire of which thou hast inspired me. I feel in myself a great wish to please thee, and great powerlessness to succeed in doing so, without great light and very special help, which I can expect only from thee. Do thou accomplish thy will in me. I know well that I am opposing it, but I eagerly, eagerly wish, at least it seems to me, not to oppose it. It is for thee to do everything. O Divine Heart of Jesus, Thou alone will have all the glory of my sanctification. If I become a saint, that appears to me clearer than daylight. But it will be a great glory for Thee, and it is for that alone that I wish to attain perfection. Amen. That is chapters 1 and 2 that I just read to you. There's a foreword or a, a preceding chapter of the life of St. Margaret Mary, and I will get to that. It's not a chapter, it's just... A, it's a, almost like a pamphlet size writing about her life so I will stop there <sighs> boy I'm tired I worked um, I started at 12 
work till six. You got a lot of wallpaper up. It's pretty nice when you can move fast. My helper literally drove me nuts. I'm, I'm leaving him home tomorrow because he literally drove me nuts today. The man cut wallpaper short two days in a row. No sense in even talking about it. I'm just glad I'm not there right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work alone tomorrow. I can only, f I can fight with myself. Anyway, thanks for watching, and um, I hope you'll listen to this book as I go along with it. It gets very interesting. It sounds a little boring, it's a little deep, but wait till you see what's coming. It's very interesting stuff.